I think the more that um, very centralized systems masquerading as decentralized systems continues to, to fly under the radar, I think that's when users get hurt. I think that's when investors get hurt. Ethereum is the, the vision for building the decentralized web. So what Bitcoin had first originally created was, you know, a peer-to-peer, uh, a peer-to-peer -peer system where you can transfer uh, value to another person without any third-party intermediaries. Um, but what Ethereum really does is that it introduces um, a great deal of flexibility and um, programmability to that model. So instead, with Bitcoin, there are very strict limits as to um, what conditions need to be met in order for you to send that value, um, what type of value it is. Um, and uh, with Ethereum, you have a greater flexibility and be able to create those rules yourself. So when it comes to the supply limit, comes to um, you know, the, the ways in which you can interact with the blockchain. Um, this is all up to the user by coding their own smart contracts, which is basically code that's run on a decentralized platform. It's not run through a centralized server. So when you run that code, um, we, we call it um, virtually unstoppable. Um, if you wanted to, to, to censor that, that code from running or make that application um, basically uh, stop working, uh, you would need to, to take down the blockchain itself. And Ethereum, unlike other smart contract protocols, has achieved such a high level of decentralization relative to other newer smart contract block blockchains. Hmm. Um, and so I think the value of Ethereum is is if we're moving towards an industry where we want to see value and we want to see applications um, not being run through centralized companies, tech companies, big tech giants, um, but we want to hand back control to users, I think um, Ethereum is one of the best places, I think, and the best networks to prove um, that something like this can happen. Um, and so we do see actually a lot of TVL, the majority of total value locked um, in decentralized finance applications uh, continue to be held on Ethereum, uh, NFTs, um, gaming applications, some of the other um, industries that are experimenting on Ethereum. And so I think at a high level, these kinds of visions are, are much easier to explain to investors. And I think, in, and, and even just users themselves of like why, why people should consider Ethereum as an alternative um, to, to the current internet. Um, I think when it comes down to how exactly we achieve that vision and the technology that's required to support that vision, that is an area that I think requires a lot more digging and um, is something even I struggle um, on the daily to, to really keep up with because that technology is continue, it's continually changing. Indeed, to your points about uh, this distributed network uh, that controls uh, ex execution of applications. One of the early descriptions uh, of Ethereum was the notion of the world computer, the idea that you could have a decentralized system running on nodes all across the world, not controlled by any centralized entity that could execute uh, code across a wide variety of applications, drawing on a wide variety of data sources. Uh, one of the challenges of this is you talk about flexibility is that the flip side of this flexibility is complexity so that the Bitcoin network, when we discuss it, relatively simpler code base because of the lack of uh, you know some of these applications that we're talking about being able to have customizable, executable code, a Turing complete system, as computer scientists call it, the idea that you can essentially execute on the Ethereum network in theory, any application that could be executed on any computer anywhere in the world. This is a tremendous level of complexity that's been added to the network. And there are those costs in terms of the difficulty in maintaining the code. And also, of course, something that's been very much in the forefront of investors' minds in crypto lately, which are the risks of exploits and security attacks. Do you see that moment of merge? It sounds like from what you were saying earlier that you do as a potential risk, as something that could be a place where bad actors come to exploit that critical moment, that inflection point, that moment of maximal risk in the Ethereum network? 100%. And I think 
In fact, it's a really good mindset to have when building these upgrades, when building a system, to think of the most adversarial environment as you can possibly imagine, because that's what builds resiliency. And I think the more that um, very centralized systems masquerading as decentralized system continues to, to fly under the radar, I think that's when users get hurt. I think that's when investors get hurt. And um, I think that part of the reason why this transition to proof of stake has taken as long as it has is because developers, Ethereum core developers are very conscientious about this potential risk. Um, and, and truly, I think one of the reasons that I think Ethereum is so valuable in my eyes is because um, it does sacrifice a lot of that decentralization and a lot of that mobility, so to speak, um, because it's trying to achieve more. And so there are sacrifices that need to be made in the short term as it relates to um, be, being a more secure system like Bitcoin, being a more decentralized system like Bitcoin, because it's trying to do and achieve more than Bitcoin currently has. And obviously the jury is still out about whether Ethereum will be able to achieve its vision as the world computer. But I think the fact that Ethereum is pursuing such a vision and is trying to, to really advance the technology of blockchain far beyond simply peer-to-peer -peer payments um, and, and a monetary good, I think is, is worth it's worth paying attention to. Yeah. Talking of decentralization, I know you've done some recent research where you have done some analysis of the level of decentralization in the Ethereum network. Walk us through some of those findings. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the most recent report that I've written for Galaxy Digital Research is an analysis of how distributed and decentralized Ethereum supply is today. And this topic really matters because once Ethereum transitions to proof of stake, the amount of ETH that users hold directly impacts the amount of influence they can have on um, network consensus, um, block production, on transaction finalization. So if there is a user that controls a very large amount of total ETH supply, that individual um, or that entity could potentially um, influence um, the, the activities of the network. Um, and so having a very decentralized supply for Ethereum is, is extremely important to the security of, of Ethereum post-merge. Um, and because Ethereum developers are now getting really close to activating the merge, um, it's worth taking a look at how Ethereum supply distribution has changed over time. So this first chart that I'm showing um, illustrates the different ways in which ETH has been generated. You, one of the first things that you can notice is that about half of total ETH supply was created at Genesis. It wasn't distributed through the public process of proof of work mining. It was actually distributed through uh, to early project um, founders, such as Vitalik Buterin, Joe Lubin, um, probably Charles Hoskinson, uh, these figures. Um, it was also distributed, some amount was distributed to the Ethereum Foundation. Um, and then another uh, portion of this amount was, was uh, distributed to uh, distributed through an initial coin offering. So that initial coin offering accounts for 50% of total ETH supply, and then the distribution to uh, Ethereum Foundation and early project contributors is another roughly 10. Um, so the majority of supply um, has been issued on Ethereum um, in, in processes that occurred before the launch of the blockchain. And that for, for years, uh, critics have, have talked about um, the ways in which those processes can be gained. Um, so with an ICO, even if you implement limits on how much ETH a single purchaser of the ICO um, can have, you know, you can spin up multiple addresses um, and, and kind of fake your identity in that way. Um, so it's very difficult to know exactly, um, even if you have all the data, uh, which I did get, all the data on you know the the flows of the ICO funds. It's it's hard to know um, how distributed that supply really was at the beginning of, of Ethereum's genesis. Um, but if we look at some of the other data um, to illustrate over time how 
how Ethereum's supply has changed. Again, 40% um, of new supply has been issued, which dilutes uh, that Genesis supply. And so I was able to find data. Um, I was able to get data from, from Nansen that shows that um, over 95% of, of ICO funds have been transferred to centralized exchanges, suggesting that um, the funds have been moved off chain or perhaps even sold for other tokens. So there's another metric from Nansen that illustrates that actually a very small percentage, 2.3% of the total pre-mined supply um, has not moved um, over the past uh, seven years. But so that's like close to 97% that has, you know, been transferred to other accounts. Um, and just from a more holistic uh, point of view, um, I've done some analysis analyzing HODL waves, which is which tracks the duration of time before a coin is last moved on chain. Um, and, and of the total supply of Ethereum that has been created since Genesis, um, the vast majority of it has has been has been liquid, has been moving around, uh, transferring, being transferred from one account to another. Um, and there's a couple other metrics in here um, that perhaps we can, that I would encourage listeners of this video to take a look at. Um, but all this to say that um, through market cycles that do force early holders to sell their ETH, in addition to proof of work mining um, and, um, you know, the influx of decentralized applications that um, encourage holders to try putting, to spend their ETH on transactions, uh, lock it into, say, um, a, a DeFi application. All of these, these trends have really, really support the idea that Ethereum supply has become more decentralized over time, um, which is, is very positive. But I think the, the kind of there's always good news and there's always bad news. And I think that's the good news, but also the kind of the bad news is that um, already we are starting to see a lot of the supply that is staked on Ethereum for Ethereum's merge um, become centralized to a single staking provider, and that is Lido. Um, and there are a bunch of solutions being worked on by developers to address this issue, um, but that's just kind of another related topic that as much as supply has become more decentralized over time on Ethereum, uh, we're still starting to see, we're starting to see now some centralizing forces that might change that, right. di change that dynamic post-merge. Hey, visionaries, thank you for tuning in. For more free crypto content like this, head over to Real Vision dot com forward slash crypto you'll get early access to the most brilliant minds in the space to cut through the noise get in-depth analysis and get you ahead of the curve with unbiased insights